Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. My guest today is Congressman John Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus has been a Republican member of the Illinois Congressional Delegation since his election to Congress in 1996. <clears throat> he represents the Illinois 15th Congressional District. Congressman Shimkus is a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and is chairman of the Subcommittee on the Environment and the Economy. That subcommittee has oversight of key environmental laws uh, and programs and has focus on the intersection of regulations and jobs, manages coal combustion residuals, and the long-standing challenge of storing spent nuclear fuel. Congressman John Shimkus, welcome to the conversation. Good to be with you, Lee. Um, at the end of the last time you were here, we were talking about uh, spent nuclear fuel. Uh, I just thought I might ask, has there been any movement on that uh, reservoir that had been built deep in the mountain to store fuel? Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of activities going on. There's been two court rulings that have really, in essence, in favor of those of us who want to comply with law. So uh, the federal courts have said the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has to do their safety and evaluation report. So we've been pushing the <laughs> Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is an independent commission, to follow not only the letter of the law, but the rule of the courts. Uh, we just had a hearing uh, two weeks ago uh, to reinforce our commitment and, and, and our eyes on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So that would have been the end of April. So, yeah. Cause, right, because people are seeing this sometime in the future, so just to give them an idea. Yeah, and, and so then the other thing that's happened is there's been another court case that said that the federal government can no longer accept the charge to store uh, spent nuclear fuel yeah. because federal government is not moving on a long-term geological repository. So about $700 million a year is not going to go to the federal treasury um, because the rate payers in those states that have nuclear power are not going to have to pay that provision until we get our act together and move in compliance with the law. You know, while we're how much are we talking about here, and, and I mean money. I mean, how much stuff are we talking? Well, there's about? seventy thousand metric tons uh, of spent nuclear fuel right now, uh, between sixty and seventy. Um, uh, Yucca Mountain is believed to be able to hold seventy thousand metric tons. So that's part of that debate of uh, Yucca Mountain is really, in essence, already filled based upon current permitting, uh, do we have to start looking for another location? So yeah, it, I wouldn't wish this challenge on anybody. It's been one of the most frustrating things. But in reality, it's the President of the United States breaking the law by not complying with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And it's, it's Senator Reid who uh, has been able to convince the President because, of course, Yucca Mountain is 90 miles north of, uh, northwest of Las Vegas. And that's pretty far. Uh, but uh, he has blocked anything from moving that would continue to fund uh, the finishing of Yucca Mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, because I remember we talked about this and just wanted to see if there had been any well, forward movement on this. And we have, we have uh, Exelon is the largest <coughs> nuclear utility in the country. It's in the state of Illinois. Our closest plant is in Clinton, Illinois. Of course, Ameren's got one in Callaway. So there is spent nuclear fuel in those two locations that should be moved to Yucca Mountain per the law. It's just the administration is not complying with the law. What are the French doing? I mean, they have a huge new pr program to generate electricity, and they must be generating a large amount of spent nuclear fuel. They have them in interim storage underneath, uh, you know, in concrete casts under the ground, uh, underneath like aircraft hangars, from uh, what's been told to me. I've never visited that area. Uh, but the scientific consensus is that eventually all high-level nuclear waste, uh, it was some of that spent fuel, some of that's defense waste, should be in long-term geological storage, uh, which means long-term underneath the ground somewhere. And, and that's where even the French would eventually want to move theirs, but they have yet to do that. So even they really have no permanent solution to, uh, uh, to spent nuclear fuel. 
that's crazy. and that and they're big on this. Too. Eighty percent of the electricity is generated now. Remember, France is not the size no, of the United right. States. Yeah, I mean, it's, but still, eighty percent. Not as big as Texas, is it? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't want to go there though. <laughs> the uh, uh, but uh, eighty percent of their electricity is generated by nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we're going to do a little show and tell here. Then we're going to jump into some other things. I already prepped you for it. There's no big secret. But uh, we're going to talk about uh, regulations here in this country, mm -hmm. which are getting to the point now where um, uh, I feel like I'm being treated like a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, this gas can right here is an old gas can, which I've used for many years. It has, which people will recognize, it's got that. And you take this part off, mm -hmm. put it in there, and then, boy, you can just pour that fuel right out. Yeah. Okay, there's that one. Then there's another kind that I've had for many, many years, and you unscrew that, and the next thing you know, you can just pull that right out and just pour, no problem. But then I got a new weed whip just the other day, and the guy said, hey, why don't you get a nice new can? So I did, and this was on the inside, and when I took it out, and after the gas was in there, and I go to pour it in the weed whip, and nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing, and I had to go back <clears throat> excuse me, to Home Depot for training on how to use this thing. And even after they showed me, they showed me wrong. And it still didn't work. And I finally had to switch to a different uh, thing that actually pours out. But apparently now, you're supposed to push this thing down, or no, first you turn this over, then you have to push this down somehow before it'll actually pour out. Now, I bring this up to you because somehow... The federal government, according to the people of the store, are getting the blame for this. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's all true. I mean, I had the same thing. I had to replace my uh, gas can, and uh, not only, I couldn't get a, a plastic one anymore. I mean, and uh, I had to get a, a metal one. Really? And the argument. Well, go to Home Depot. You can get one and of these the, dumb ones. The argument was that there had been litigation based upon a class action lawsuit that actually closed the company that made this type of plastic gas can and that it, through the courts and through the rules metal gas cans are now in essence coming back mm -hmm. so um, i remember them yeah they're heavy yeah. <laughs> so Heavier. i'd rather have my old one i'm still uh, i'm hanging on I'm to these other two i mean i guess it's very very safe but uh i i never had a problem with that uh, big government always moves to regulate more regulation takes away personal freedoms and liberties. Uh, that's kind of the mantra of what, when we want to get smaller, more efficient government. Uh, that's the mantra. Uh, before we went on air, you talked about, well, do it. And I said, well, we need, uh, in the way yes, the Constitution works, you've got to have both the House and, and the Senate. You've got to have the President sign, sign the bill. Right. On Elections what? matter. I, yes, they do. Absolutely. And I want to know why the public doesn't understand that the people that they elect make these kind of intricate decisions that actually have an impact on whether you can easily pour uh, gas into a weed whip or a lawnmower. Well, I, I think they might be starting to. I think uh, the, uh, the Tea Party movement of 20, uh, 2010, the 2012 elections, even though uh, uh, the presidency didn't move. We did get uh, movement again in the House, and uh, the environment's going to be pretty interesting uh, this fall. I think it's still mostly focused around, I mean, the new attention is, is, both, is, is around the micromanaging of our health care sector and how you know, government now is intervening and in, in determining the type of health insurance policies that people have. And for the most part, we're paying more and getting less. There's a small sliver of Medicaid expansion that, that are being helped, but as far as hospitals and providers, uncompensated care is still a problem. There's still cost shifting, and unless you free up the individual in, in the market to have really a vibrant competitive system, you're going to have a centralized system that moves to um, rationing care. Before you got to Congress, 1986 I believe it was, you know the term MTALA? No, sure. Yeah, okay. So Congress passes this amendment to the Social Security Act, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, I believe is, is what it stands for. And in there it said that uh, if you make it to the hospital, the hospital, if, you're, if, it's, if you make it to the hospital, they must see you in the emergency room. I think that that was based upon 
uh, some uh, newspaper reports where I think there was like a guy that got stabbed in the back and he goes to a hospital and they, he has no insurance. They say, hey, take him you know, to the city hospital. Mm -hmm. And that happens in a few places. And right. next thing you know, Congress passes this law. Right. But what they don't seem to understand is that when they did that, that they actually turned the, uh, wait, uh, the, um, uh, the emergency room into their primary care physician of yep. some people which then starts costing uh, the hospitals a huge amount of money. Then for some reason, the federal government decides to step in and start filling in the money instead of recognizing they made an error in EMTALA mm -hmm. and rewriting the law. And now the, in, what was it, 2009, the excuse was, well, all this emergency room stuff is killing us. We've got to find a way to solve that problem so that we don't have people going to the emergency room, which, by the right. way, was passed back in 1986 by the Congress, both houses, and signed by a president. Why is it that we don't go back? You're an office, you're, you're former military. You understand that when a plan isn't working, you go back. Yeah. You don't keep stumbling forward into enemy fire. Or are you, oh yeah, and the healthcare thing, are you triage? Are you identify the emergent emergency needs and they're allowed access to the emergency room? And I, I don't argue with any of your uh, laying out of the problem. The, uh, but again, to do that, you have to, you have to change the law. Um, EMTALA uh, does force hospitals like Anderson right down the road here, to, and anyone who goes to emergency room, which I've There's done signs recently, up on the walls that say, hey, here's your rights. You're just, you know, you, you got to get access. Um, they do, uh, they're able to take the more emergent people first, and you can, but you will eventually be seen if you go there, and that care is expensive and many times it's uncompensated and then there is cost shifting. The, uh, the hospital association got involved with the national health care law thinking that if everyone had insurance that would, that would help compensate them better for when people use that services but uh, I, don't, worked out? I don't think they read the fine print because uh, there's still going to be 30 million uninsured Americans, they still have this law. A lot of us thought well in that process should they at least address EMTALA in the passage of the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. which, uh, or should they have done uh, uh, medical liability reform? Some things that help address the increased cost of healthcare, but none of those were addressed. Right. So now we're healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, healthcare right here. Yeah. It won't pour. Well, and, and then going back to your, uh, you know, obviously how you laid this whole thing out is that people are getting an understanding about the, how uh, big government is and how when it tries to fix problems for everybody, it really deprives people of individual freedoms to make their own choices and accept their own responsibilities. Right, except of course, and, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything new, people still have a bad feeling about the Republican Party. I mean, they, they yeah. it's, you mentioned the Tea Party. I know, I know some of these people, I've had them here, they're not talking positively about, boy, boy, if we can just elect more Republicans yeah. because they feel that electing Republicans hasn't gotten the country yeah. anywhere in the way that you're talking about going. Hey, I, I love the, the Tea Party. They are um, individual citizens who have decided to get involved in the political process. That's a former government high school teacher. Just I like you did. I can't ask, just, I I mean, can't ask for anything I more mean, than you, that. I remember you did yeah. this. You were a high school yeah. teacher, then you became, right. you know, low level. You were at uh, township. Township level, county level, and then, and then got then to, right. Lucked out and moved in when, the, uh, when Senator Durbin moved up to yeah. Senate. So, I mean, we don't, that we, Republican Party really has no beef. It's just that you know, we still have to govern. We still have to deal with the nuclear waste issue. You just can't shut down the government and you've got nuclear waste moving around the country and you don't have a place to put it. So there is a role for government. And I think that's part of an educational process. That's part of a um, um, maturation mm -hmm. of, of the process. And uh, um, I still think uh, the Republicans believe that the Tea Party movement is a, an, uh, is a vital, integral part of our coalition. Well, here you get to in long format be able to say these things where to those people who are listening they actually get an idea of the a b c d ah here's mm -hmm. how we got all the way down here to z right do you find that your message gets across or that others messages get across to the public through um, television radio newspapers or is it so chopped up 
or diluted purposefully that your message does not get through. Well, I, I think it's dependent upon the district and, and these, uh, the districts across the country are, are, are have great variety. And you could represent four or five blocks of downtown Chicago because of the population there. And for, for that individual member to get on Chicago TV is almost impossible, a member of Congress. I represent parts of 33 counties. So I move around my district and when I go to uh, Golconda, Illinois, or Lawrenceville, or Danville, having a congressman there is kind of a, a big deal. So I'll get uh, the uh, uh, broadcast and print coverage. But th the other issue is that for good and for ill, we have now a, a new ability to get our message out or for people to attack us through social media. I think most members are very active on that, whether it's Facebooking or Twitter accounts or or uh, using that, those type of messages and those opportunities. Now they cut both ways. Our opposition can, can pummel us using social media too, but uh, we just gotta be flexible and, and uh, being able to, to move uh, in that. And so I, I think uh, I'm, I'm kinda happy with uh, how we're able to get our message out. This leads us into two important issues that uh, we're gonna talk about. One, your uh, .com act that you're yes. working on, and uh, side, uh, you know, right alongside that is net neutrality. Right. First, explain to people what is your view of, of net neutrality. Well, I, I believe, I'm, I'm a market-based conservative Republican, so net neutrality is, is, is a premise that we have these pipes to send data and information, voice and video. And like they're getting right now through charter. Right, right. but that, that that's, that I think they really believe that's an unlimited supply, so everyone should be able to use that for no cost. Mm -hmm. Right, net neutrality. Everybody's neutral. Everybody's where mm -hmm. your signal gets there at the same time as everybody yeah, else's yeah, yeah. signal. Gets my there. my argument is, someone owns the pipes, right? And if you want to incentivize more data, more information, you got to use the market signals of when people want to have a premium use of data flow that if they can, and this is what the FCC now is talking about, although the new FCC commissioner is getting pummeled by, by the net neutrality folks, where he's saying, you know, there's regular data that can flow, but if you want to, you know, subscribe to Netflix, and Netflix wants to contract with the pipe to be able to make sure their signal is strong, uh, that's a market signal which people would pay for, and then you would hope it would incentivize more build up. So that's kind of how I, I, I look at it from a market-based, uh, someone made a capital expense to build out these pipes, whether it's cable or fiber or satellite or cellular, and that uh, if you want to use a premium part of that package and are willing to pay more, you, you can. Mm -hmm. And then what is your dot-com act? Well, dot com, I mean, dot com deals with the ICANN and the uh, top level domain. So well, dot Because a lot of people haven't heard about it. Yeah, this, so, so. It, but a lot of people use the internet now. So if they, they email me, the ending is dot gov, dot government, or dot edu if you're doing something at SIU Edwardsville or um, dot com, dot, dot com, dot net. Someone, dot TV. Someone sets these up. Right. Someone approved the breathing. And this is ICANN. Uh, and it, but the, our federal government has like the veto power to, uh, to say yes or no to all this stuff. It's kind of the last vestige of go our U.S. government control over the Internet, which Al Gore didn't invent, but was developed through U.S. government funds through our ARPANET and the military mm -hmm. and the like. So um, the administration now wants to hand this last control piece, and we would argue show us that there's been a problem, right? Uh, to an international decision-making body. Um, they call it a quote-unquote multi-stakeholder model. And all we want to know is what does that mean? Now, when you listen to the private sector, like the Googles and the Facebooks, and they say multi-stakeholder model means that the private sector, Googles and Microsoft, they'll have the preponderance of the decision-making, and that's the multi-staker. When you listen to some of our um, uh, not even allies or friends, some of our competitors now in the international world, like China or Russia, they would say, oh, multi-stakeholder means that we're going to have a more of a say in controlling this. I think before we turn this over, we should know which one of those two worldviews is, 
is what we mean by multi-stakeholder. So the dot-com act just basically says, before we hand this over, we want a government accountability office, RIG, to do a review of the final contract and the final handover, and for them to report back to us, it's not a partisan agency, whether this is in our national interest or not. Mm -hmm. And we don't do it until we get that final report, uh, regardless of what the final report says. Uh, and it's amazing how many people are saying, oh, you can't do this. We passed it through. You can't this, do which? We, we can't move my bill because... Uh, to ask a question. Yeah, to ask a question. To, to have an outside third party independent review of, of whatever the decision will made, even though we don't know what that decision is. Well, may I interrupt for just one second? As I recall reading that um, because of the NSA leaks, the leader of the uh, country of Brazil, and I'm forgetting her name right now, uh, was very excited to hear the U.S. is going to start, you know, as compensation for spying on her, that uh, we were going to turn this over to this international group. And I suspect that there's a lot of other leaders who are chomping at the bit to have control over the Internet, which, by the way, I like the Internet pretty much the way it works right now. But I'm an American. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe the Russians, maybe the Chinese, maybe the Brazilians have a different idea of how the Internet should work. Uh, well, I know there's 13 international servers, 11 of them are in the United States of America. The ICANN headquarters is here in the United States. I would argue that it's working well. We need definitions mm -hmm. uh, and there's, that we should have a third party review of this that's independent and nonpartisan. I, well, yes, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear some of those answers as well. Uh, let's move on to another area that you're working on. It's called the Chemicals in Commerce Act. That's yours in the House. Yeah. And then there's a, the Chemicals Safety Improvement Act in the Senate. Now, before we go into your part here, I just want to read a quote from the Center for Environmental Health. They say, the acts, are Trojan horses designed to create the illusion that they are fixing our nation's broken regulatory system while in fact they're actually dismantling the few safeguards currently in place. Now, <laughs> so now we've had their side, and I, I hate to have this as sides, we're all supposed to be Americans. What is the problem which caused you to write the bill uh, for the House? Well, and I, just to respond, it is a broken current system that we have right now. Everyone agrees to that. It is a broken yeah, system. It, what is broken? Well, in 1976, we passed a law called the Toxic Chemicals Act. Okay. Um, and that was designed to identify chemicals that is, are used today in this range of 80,000 chemicals and make sure that they're safe, or if they're not safe, that they're identified and they're defined at how you handle. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the basic premise. Uh, since that time, uh, most of the 80,000 chemicals have not been reviewed. This is in 76, so I was graduating high school in 76. I always make a joke about what I was wearing then and what I'm wearing yeah. now. Yeah. You know, um, this is just not long after the EPA was first created, right, too. Right, right. So yeah. the whole process, uh, very few chemicals have been, uh, especially old chemicals, hardly any of, them, any of them have been gone through, have gone through the process. And the one that did go through the process got thrown out by the courts. You want to know what the name of that was? What? That's asbestos. Ah. So, um, so even one that we know is harmful and, and causes damage, because of the law, the courts ruled that more aggressive regulation could not be placed upon asbestos. So uh, it's, it's, Interesting. A, it's, a, it's a failed law. So what we're trying to do is uh, there is a portion of the law on new chemicals that the EPA is able to to make a determination and make a decision of uh, how you handle or can it be used in commerce. New chemicals takes a relatively quick time. So the question is, how do you address the 60,000 chemicals? Uh, but what really has thrown this into part of the debate is, can states uh, uh, rule on chemical use within their own state lines? And this addresses issues of constitutionality, interstate commerce clause, um, um, and the issue of uh, federal federal law preempting state law, uh, especially on interstate commerce. And so that's where these environmental communities are getting uh, kind of, they're kind of getting into states and passing rules and regulations on the pro prohibition of items 
which may or may not be scientifically based, maybe more emotionally based. And so, and so uh, that's why we're involved in this. Let's, let's, let's empower the EPA, use credible science, let them make a ruling, and if they make a national ruling, then that would then preempt a state law. But only after they make a ruling on if it's safe or if it's not, and if it's not safe, it, what process can it be used? How can you handle it? There are a lot of chemicals that never go to the consumer. They're just part of the manufacturing sector. So they're in a manufacturing facility, they, they're used to make something happen, and then they're recovered and they're used to make that happen. It never goes into cons a consumer product. So 95% uh, of everything in this room has, has been touched by the chemical manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And you talk about regulation. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, do we want affordable, acceptable uh, products that, that, are, that the individual consumer could use? And this, in the process, if we fix this, should help that. There are some people who would like to go back to the 19th or 18th century, actually the 18th century, before we really got into Yeah, I'd like using. them to go back to that time. I don't think they'd find it as great. I don't think great. they would either. <laughs> yes, they think it was. Certainly their cell phone <laughs> yeah. wouldn't work. Yeah, that's right. And their, uh, you know, their TVs wouldn't work. And uh, many of the, you know, the skates that they like to run around in or the bikes that they, you know, which wasn't well, invented they, at that uh, point. Diseases, right. uh, you know, uh, mass deaths because of, it, it just would, would yeah. not be a good time age 40 was old. Yeah, that's right. So we'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, we've only got like just, couple, just a couple of minutes left. Um, I want just quick question, quick answer. There is a tendency in this country, we're going back to communication, for media organizations to be consolidating over the years. We just saw where, um, uh, what was it, Time Warner and Comcast, mm -hmm. Uh, are coming together, which is enormous, and especially Time Warner, which produces content, and uh, Comcast, which shows content. Uh, are we getting to the point in 30 seconds where we have um, too much consolidation going on in the industry, or you think this is healthy? Um, I don't think we have, uh, I don't think the, the universe is getting smaller. I think the universe is getting bigger. With online, with all the access to information through the World Wide Web and search engines, and and that uh, I just think that there's people have a vast, a larger opportunity to get information than they ever had in really probably the existence of mankind. Yeah, well, that's that good old internet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we've, we've, we've done pretty well. Um, um, but, you know, it just seems to me, uh, personal story, I, my friend and I started out back when we were 13 years old in radio he was in radio for many, many years, and now it turns out that many of the radio stations that we used to work for have all been consolidated into single ownerships, and there's no room anymore for disc jockeys because it's all pre-recorded and in one little studio and sent to six, and we're out of time. We have we have buggy makers anymore. We don't have whip makers. We don't really have yeah. candle makers anymore. Right. Thank you very much for your comments and for your time, Congressman Shimkus. I've been speaking with Congressman John Shimkus. He's a uh, Republican member of the uh, Illinois delegation uh, for District uh, 15. Thank you for being with us. This is going to be uploaded to YouTube so you can show it to your friends. Goodbye.